Hi, Jerry Pal listeners. Just want to do a special shout out in the beginning to all of the recent donors to the Jerry Pal podcast. If you're interested in donating, go to the Jerry Pal website and just click that big blue button. Special thank you to Margaret Leung, Huey Lin, Ken Longa, Susan McFadden, Carrie Rubenstein, Marissa Galicia Castillo, Cara Bischoff, Kate Mesrich, James Tulski, Louise Aronson, Asher Edwards, Mark Apfel, Michael Bordofsky, and Meg Walhagen. Thank you very much. And on with the show. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, I think we're we're having beers today. We're having beers. Beers. The beers. <laughs> who do we have that's with a, us today? That's who it was named after, right? We'll, we'll learn about that. Okay. We're delighted to welcome Mike Steinman, who's a geriatrician, professor of medicine at UCSF in the Division of Geriatrics, prior guest on this podcast. He's co-PI of the USD Prescribing Research Network. Welcome back to the Jerry Pal podcast, Mike. Thanks for having me. And we're delighted to welcome Todd Semla, who is a clinical pharmacist and associate professor at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Welcome to the Jerry Pell podcast, Todd. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, so we're going to be talking about, it's probably a joke that both Mike and Todd are so very tired of when we're talking about the beers list. Uh, <laughs> but we're going to be talking about the beers list and potentially inappropriate drug prescribing in older adults. But before we do that, who has a song request for Alex? I think that's Mike. Mike? All right. We, we were both, Todd and I were both talking about it, and we thought that Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood by the Animals would be an apt song for this podcast. Yeah, I think Mike seconded it, right? No, I think I did. I had some more in Zevon requests. Oh, that's right, right, right. Yeah. But Todd has this on uh, an LP, right? Yes, I do. Yeah. This is a great choice. I'm a little sick, so let's see what happens here. It could be exciting. Baby, do you understand me now? Sometimes I feel a little mad Well, don't you know that no one alive Can always be an angel When things go wrong, I seem to be bad I'm just a soul whose intentions are good Oh, Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood <laughs> All right. Why no, this song? You, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would say because the beers criteria, you know, can be a really useful resource. But, you know, Todd and I and many other folks have observed that they can be misused and misinterpreted. So, you know, as we prepare to release the updated version of Beers Criteria, we're really excited to get the sort of new recommendations out there, but we are equally excited to make sure that people use them in the ways that they're intended and minimize use in the ways in which they are not intended and could cause inadvertent harm. So we're going to talk both of that, but maybe you could just like briefly, what is the history of the Beers is it beers criteria, beers list? How should I reference this? In the podcast? Well, um, you know, your earlier comment about us being tired of the beer jokes about the beers, we went so far as to have AGS, you know, copyright it. So it's officially the AGS beers criteria. All right, beers criteria. Um, yeah. What's the AGS beers criteria? AG, beers criteria. AGS beers criteria. What's yeah, the history behind it? So it was started back in 1991 was the first edition was published by a geriatrician named Mark Beers. And he's, he was at UCLA. So he got a bunch of his um, colleagues together and they came up with a list of medications that they thought were problematic and whose risks outweighed the benefit. But they were specifically looking at nursing home population. Mm. And then when they updated it in 1997, they expanded it to include um, all older adults. And then there was a version in 2003, um, which Mark participated in, and he's since passed. Um, and then in 2010, the AGS took over because uh, it was sort of wafting out there and people were wondering, when are you going to update it? When's, who's going to update it? And, um, and we were trying to get funding from different places and then AGS kind of stepped in. And so they've been the stewards of it since 2010. And when was the last update? In 2015. 2015. 
2019. 2019. Uh, I, sl- I slept through one, Mark. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so is the plan updated every four years? Well, it's, we try every three years. Okay. But sometimes... Uh, sometimes pandemics happen? Well, pandemics and the, ex- the amount of literature that the panel has to wade through um, seems to be growing ex- exponential. It doesn't, doesn't mean we're finding any more diamonds, but there's certainly a lot of coal to look through. Mm. And Mike, you were talking about uh, not being misunderstood. What is the intention of the Beerus criteria? The AGS Beerus criteria. Thank you. So the intention of the AGS Beerus criteria is to provide information primarily to clinicians, although to other audiences as well, but medications that we consider to be potentially inappropriate in older adults. And by that, we mean that in many or most older adults, these drugs have either lack of benefit or a degree of harm relative to benefit that is inferior to readily available alternatives. So it's not to say that these drugs should never be used. Um, There are some older adults in whom these are the correct drugs, either because of their particular clinical circumstances or because shared decision-making and patient values and preferences. You know, it's not to say these drugs should never be used. But we also recognize that a lot for a lot of older adults, these drugs can cause more harm than benefit, either just by themselves or relative to these other alternatives. So we want to alert clinicians as well as patients and policymakers to the presence of these drugs. And therefore, for, for most older adults, try to steer them towards safer and more effective alternatives while not being going to the extreme where we are overly restricting access to these drugs for people on whom they are appropriate. So can you are there any examples that you'd be willing to share about um, people or systems using it inappropriately or potentially thinking about using it inappropriately? Using uh, inappropriately uh, lists inappropriately. <laughs> potentially inappropriate. <laughs> potentially. <laughs> like what's an example of that? I think things we've heard from, we've received, you know, letters from over the years is is perhaps there's a a PBM or something that's being overly restrictive or overly interpreting um, uh, a, a criteria, leaving out one of the caveats we may have on it, or just saying avoid means no and no in all, all our circumstances and um, making it extremely onerous to try to make an appeal through that. Hmm. Yeah. So using it, say, as a quality metric would be another example, or using it in an end of life or hospice setting. Would those be examples? Yeah, I mean, they explicitly, I mean, the criteria explicitly are designed not or to exclude people in hospice or at the end of life. And it says that very directly, that is not the intended audience for this. But that said, this is a situation in which people might not read that caveat and would apply it in that situation, which would be wrong. Or as Todd said, you know, getting wrapped up in, you know, like, you know, endless reams of paperwork trying to clear prior authorizations uh, that really overly restrict access to drugs on the list, even for people on whom they are uh, reasonable choices. And is there, to your knowledge, a Beers criteria or a equivalent for people who are at the end, nearing the end of life or have a limited life expectancy, say six months or less? There are some lists which are out there. There's nothing that's really sort of gained traction as a more, you know, I'd say broadly accepted or universal guideline, uh, but huh. people have come up with lists about medications which are potentially inappropriate uh, for people at the end of life. And okay. those include drugs, which um, often drugs which have um, are preventive drugs with a long lifetime to benefit. So there's an opportunity there for the AHPM, some name, list of <laughs> drugs to potentially avoid. Okay, Eric, you have a question? Well, I was going to say, I think ePrognosis has a little bit of a time to benefit table that folks can check out. Our own website. Um, yeah. <laughs> how do you want physicians to use this? Like, we're talking about ways not to use it. Like, how do you want like me to use this in my daily practice? Well, my my uh, my short answer is we expect you to memorize it and then eat it. Um, <laughs> But ChatGPT does all my work for me now, so just make sure it knows. <laughs> we haven't we haven't we haven't signed that contract yet. Um, so I think the best thing to do is is to look through it and 
think about how you do prescribe and look for drugs on there that you maybe are prescribing regularly that you should think twice about prescribing to the to the to those particular patients. Or if you have patients who are on those medications, is it time to reconsider whether there is any benefit or the harms outweigh the benefit? So I think that those are, are good ways to um, start to use it. Yeah. yeah. And the analogy I like to sort of use is, is to think of it like a stop sign, um, where if you're thinking about prescribing one of these drugs, or you have a patient who comes to you and they're already taking one of these drugs, that you kind of take a close look and you said, stop, you know, is this the right drug for this patient? You kind of go through that mental process, talking to the patient, understanding their actual reaction to the drug, looking around, looking left, looking right at your stop sign for potential alternatives. And if the if the decision at the end of the day, this is the right drug for the patient, then after stopping, then you go. Yeah. But it does kind of provide that caution, kind of slows things down to make sure you're really paying attention. You know, that of course should apply for any drug, not just for the Beers criteria, but because the Beers criteria are kind of um, you know, higher risk for being drugs that you would want to avoid, it does merit that extra pause in really thinking about it before you then proceed. I have a question for both of you, because both of you are interested in deep prescribing. As you're reviewing the literature and you're trying to decide how to revise these lists, I'm sure you're noticing deficiencies in um, certain areas. And one of them, I would guess, is that there are many more uh, studies, trials of initiating drugs than there are deprescribing drugs. Is that your sense as well? And then what do you do when, like you just said, Eric should think about using these lists when a patient is either... Uh, you're considering starting it, or they're on the drug already and you're considering stopping it. Any thoughts about the the level of evidence for deprescribing um, somebody who's already on the drug? You're right. There's not a whole lot of data about deprescribing. The vast majority of evidence comes from either randomized control trials where you have a group who starts it and a group who doesn't, or observational studies in which you find an exception cohort people who start the drug and you compare them to a group of people who didn't and follow them forward in time. Yeah, so the data on deprescribing is limited. And interestingly, you know, if you look closely at the criteria, we encourage people to look closely because there are important nuances in there. There are some criteria in which the criteria says avoid initiating the drug. Um, and the reason why is because there are the the to the extent to which there are deprescribing studies out there, some of them randomized, but many more observational or others, there is some evidence that that there can be a differential effect between starting the drug and stopping it. And it's not 100% clear why. And because these studies are imperfect, it's unclear if that's a true difference or it's just sort of an artifact of research randomness. But there, there can be some differences between starting and stopping, particularly if someone's been taking a drug for a long time and they really seem to be tolerating it well, then that might provide a different risk-benefit calculus than someone who you're thinking about newly starting the drug and then they're exposed to all of that kind of upfront risk. Mm -hmm. um, so, so most of the criteria of the drug just say like avoid the drug from uh, avoid this drug for most patients and don't make a distinction between continuing versus starting. But there are some criteria in, in which we do make that distinction where we sp specify avoid initiation and then maybe consider deprescribing for the patient already on it. Yeah, there are some drugs uh, for which when you stop the drug, if you just stop it without tapering, there are potentially harmful effects. You don't go back to a place. You know, it's not equivalent to the person who hasn't yet started it. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, right. Um, right. So that that's even independent. That's even assuming you do an appropriate taper of a drug that does need a taper. Yeah. So you could definitely can do direct harm for many of these drugs if you stop them abruptly. Say someone's on a you know benzodiazepines are one of some of the best the best known drugs uh, on the the Beers criteria. You know, for good reason they're overused and they cause all sorts of harms. Mm -hmm. But if a patient's been taking a benzodiazepine every day for the last ten years and then you tell them tomorrow to stop it, like they're going to be in a world of pain, uh, and that's not mm -hmm. going to be good for anyone. Um, mm -hmm. So clearly, being attentive to how to deprescribe these drugs safely is important. Great. Yeah, and I think there's um, two really good examples because this is the first update where we really talked about deprescribing and brought it into the into the the beers criteria as in our discussion and, and cited some some resources for for people. But the two examples are um, the use of aspirin as a preventative measure, um, where it perceivably had been used with caution because of lack of evidence, and then the U.S. Preventative Health Services Task Force came out with their recommendation. So we moved it over to uh, an avoid and, and recommended, you know, potentially deprescribing it in patients for whom there is no perceived benefit and potentially harms. Uh, 
And the other example was in postmenopausal estrogen use, specifically um, the uh, transdermal and oral formulations, where it always had been an avoid in women over 65. And, and now it's the, the recommendation is to avoid new starts in women over 65 and women who have been continued on it to consider a deprescribing decision, you know, based on um, shared decision making and those types of things. In the article that's being published in JAGS, um, you have multiple tables. First table is potentially inappropriate drugs in older adults. It gives the drug a rationale and a recommendation with quality of evidence and strength of recommendation. Is the way I'm supposed to be using this table is I, I see the drug, I look at the rationale, and then let's say for like Migase, it's just avoid in older adults because of the rationale, which is doesn't really work and has a lot of side effects. Regular insulin, insulin sliding scale, same thing. It's just a, an avoid. Medications like nitrofurantoin, it's, there's some risk, but the rationale isn't just avoid. It's I think it was like avoid with a creatinine clearance of less than 30. And 30, yeah. yeah. Is that how I should be using this table? I think that's correct, the way you would use it, yeah. Okay. You really want to avoid nitrofurantoin, for example, in patients less than 30. Because we yeah. really don't have any evidence that it works in patients who have creatinine clearance below 30. Did you okay. say Migues? Yeah. It's not Migues? You, you cholesterol. questioning my... Uh, Generic names only. <laughs> my gastrol. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Yeah. What but, what are but, some of the other we big before make, does make the important point that like some criteria just like avoid the drug. And as we're talking before, it doesn't mean you should avoid it in a hundred percent of people. You should like avoid it in most people, but there might be some exceptions. But these other situations, like the one we we're just talking about nitrofurantoin, I mean, it's a great drug. Like people with good creatinine clearance, it's a great drug for treatment of UTIs. Um, and we should be using it. Um, the but in that case, the criteria warns people that if you're if your creatinine clearance is less than 30, or if you're thinking about using it for long-term suppression, those are situations in which A, it may not work, and B, may cause disproportionate harms relative to alternatives. So in those clinical situations, you should consider avoiding that drug. Yeah. But you know, but it doesn't mean avoid it in all situations. In many situations, it might be a, a great choice. So NSAIDs is a good example of this. I, I feel like geriatricians have a Oh, maybe it's more of a hate-hate relationship with NSAIDs right now. <laughs> What's the recommendation for NSAIDs in that table? Well, I guess I got it right here. Well, uh, Avoiding chronic use, unless there's some unless stuff, and avoiding short-term use if they're taking other things like corticosteroids, anticoagulants, antiplatelets. Yeah. Um, so but it's not a complete avoid. No, I mean, the, the big harm that we're concerned about is GI bleeding. Yeah. So that seems to be what older adults seem to be most prone to. So there's mechanisms around that, you know, even giving someone a proton pump inhibitor for coverage or an H2 blocker if that's the best alternative. Avoid using it with other drugs that are also going to increase GI bleeding, like corticosteroids, for example. Right. And then they also come up in the renal dosing table, you know, to avoid in patients who have um, creatinine clearances below 30. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. And it doesn't mean like, like, and what the criteria does not cover is if someone, you know, older adult, you know, exerts themselves, you know, disproportionately once a week, and then like, is a lot of pain, like if you want to take like a single dose of an NSAID, like once a week, that's probably reasonable. That's not what we're saying. The criteria is really referring to chronic daily use, because those are the people who are really at highest risk of GI bleed. Yeah. Any other big updates for that table for this, this time around? Or can you read my mind, Mike? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, um, so I think probably the biggest update is is what we did with anticoagulation with um, the DOAX and warfarin. So um, warfarin has moved into the avoid category unless somebody is, you know, you have no other alternatives, but specifically for um, non-valvular AFib and VTEs, things like where, when you have all other alternatives. And, and why did warfarin the, move into that table? I'll let Mike take that. Sure. Um, it's because, I mean, so we've been using Warfarin for such a long time, but imagine Warfarin was just introduced, you know, today 
and that the DOACs were introduced today. And you looked at those two you know, groups of drugs side by side, and you said, which one is better for most people with non-valvular AFib or not? I mean, it would be unambiguous that DOACs are better uh, in terms of they have equal or they're not inferior to superior in terms of preventing the outcomes we care about. Things like for VTE would be, you know, pulmonary embolism or, or AFib to be, you know, for preventing stroke. Uh, and they carry a lower bleeding risk, particularly for intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, some of the DOACs actually can confer a higher GI bleeding risk than warfarin, but globally, the risk of really serious bleeding is lower with the DOACs, and you get similar to better efficacy. And you don't have all the monitoring stuff to deal with. So on one hand, like this is a slam dunk, and this is consistent with you know all the major anticoagulation guidelines say. The caveat that we put in there is two things. First of all, the recommendation that we have is to avoid initiating warfarin uh, for initial therapy, which is distinction from someone who's already been taking it and they come to you on warfarin and say, should I change? And that's because there's data to suggest, and it's imperfect data, but there's data to suggest people who have been on warfarin for a long time, they're tolerating it well, they have a good amount of time in the therapeutic range, at least 70% that those people don't necessarily get a whole lot of benefit to switching over to DOAX. Still unclear. It's not a bad thing to switch to a DOAC, but it's not like, you know, that they, they don't seem to get a whole lot of benefit in terms of in terms of the, the, the harm uh, calculus. Um, but if you're just a new patient comes with a nuance at AFib, but they're newly considering anticoagulation, then clearly the harm benefit skews towards um, preferring DOAX. So we make that distinction for this uh, uh, drug. The other thing that we put in here, we were very mindful that there's like, in a, for, for example, like uh, these direct oral acting oral anticoagulants, like they are hella expensive. Mm especially if they're not a formulary. And the last thing we want to do is say, you know, you can't take warfarin anymore, you know, and now you have to pay $500 per month for your DOAC if it's not mm-hmm. covered by a formulary. Mm-hmm. So we are very mindful of not putting people in, you know, causing that sort of harm or, or patients who really want to stay on warfarin and they're very attached to it, like, you know, ruining the patient-doctor relationship because you get into a fight about what anticoagulant should be on. Like, that's not what we're aiming for. So we have language in this criterion that really tries to kind of call out these challenges in decision-making, recognizes that for some patients, you know, warfarin might end up being the right choice, but we're really trying to encourage people to, to not rely on warfarin as first-line therapy because of the disproportionate you know, harms relative to the alternatives. Yeah. So table, the, the I guess it was table two in the JAGS article is about potentially uh, inappropriate drugs. Table three is about potentially inappropriate meds in older adults due to drug disease or drug syndrome interactions. Like if they have heart failure, avoid things like NSAIDs. One thing that I thought was interesting, because I was trying to go through this list of things that I do, under delirium, they had you know things like anticholinergics, benzos, steroids, which all seem reasonable. I saw at the end, it had opioids, which is interesting because like when I think about delirium, I think certainly opioids can cause delirium, but pain can cause delirium too. How should I think about that with the AGS beers criteria? Well, you know, as we say in the rationale, the emerging data highlight an association between opioid administration and and delirium. Um, And then we go on to kind of point out that conundrum where you've got someone with pain and they may have delirium. Are you going to worsen it by adding an opioid? And I think the, the point here is to recognize that opioids can lead to delirium. And if you've got Um, You have to to take that into consideration clinically. If the delirium isn't clearing and you're treating the person's pain, is it because of the opioid or is it some other underlying uh, factor that hasn't been addressed? Yeah. Uh, Eric, can I bring us back to table two for a sec? Because I think there's just a few things I think that that are worth highlighting in terms of new changes. So the biggest changes that you started to explain were warfarin, but uh, you know, added getting out on the list. But another drug that's now on sort of our main list of like drugs to avoid is rivaroxaban, the treatment venous thromboembolism and atrial fib. This is a Big change, uh, because this is a very commonly used drug, and it's one of the most commonly used DOACs. If we're saying don't use warfarin, and then we're saying don't, and when I say don't, you know, put that in big, you know, quotes around that, you know, don't use rivaroxaban, that we recognize that does potentially limit choices. 
And so this was a, uh, a controversial, and controversial is the wrong word, but this this merited a lot of discussion in the panel mm-hmm. up that way and thinking through what the implications were. And again, as we said with warfarin, you know, the point is not to like restrict, you know, all uses of rivaroxaban, like for people who can only take a once a day drug, like that's the main go-to and that's a very reasonable choice. Or for people whom that's the only drug on their formula, you know, they have to pay, you know, this huge amount of money out of pocket for something else. Like these are part of clinical decision making. And there's no direct head to head trials between mm. the different DOACs. So we don't have direct randomized controlled trial mm. data to say one is better than the other. But there is a preponderance of observational evidence to suggest that the risk of GI bleeding is substantially higher on rivaroxaban compared to some other with DOAX, with the, the, the most common comparator showing that difference being a Pixaban. And so, you know, there's this push-pull about not wanting people to be overly restrictive in therapy and get people into sticky situations. But at the same time, we do want to sort of call out the fact that if, if we're thinking about, you know, the purpose of the criteria, which mm-hmm. is, you know, can we identify drugs in which there is a safer and or more effective alternative? The preponderance of evidence right now shows that if you're thinking about DOAX, you know, river oxaban is probably not your safest choice. So you've, uh, you've got a you've got a box calling this out, which is terrific because yeah. I could see where this could lead to confusion. So just to be clear, warfarin yeah. is in table two, potentially avoid. Yep. Uh, river oxaban is also in table two, potentially yep. avoid, yep. and digatriban is in table four, I believe. Yep. Uh, Use with yeah. caution. Yep. Um, so then it kind of. Raises a question, um, how much did the makers of a Pixaban pay for the AGS beers criteria this round? <laughs> Only half. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, our not listeners they did not pay, right? No? no they did not pay. Okay. Okay. Want to be clear? Want to be clear? There, a there, no. there is a firewall between the panel yes. and the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. Yeah. But it does. I mean, my point is, it kind of points you towards a Pixaban. Well, I, I guess the question is well, about pointing. Let's let's say insomnia meds, sleep medication. So uh, under table two, uh, avoid includes, which is probably the worst name of any named kind of categories of drug, non-benzodiazepine, benzodiazepine receptor agonist hypnotics. Z drugs, you know, these are the Zolpidems of the world, the ambience. And in that it says to avoid because they basically have similar, similar side effects as benzodiazepines. So does this mean that we should be using the other because there are the other ones are safer and more effective. The auric is it orixins and the uh, melatonin receptor agonists. Well, we haven't come out with um, a statement to that effect. There's always questions, are we going to update the alternatives yeah. list that we did for the 2015? Um, that's under discussion. Um, but when we look at those drugs, I think one of the things we have to understand is when you look at the lag time for falling asleep and the total sleep time improvements, it's pretty negligible. So... While they may not convey the same potential harms, one has to con- consider whether they actually have efficacy that's, you know, worth worth the money spent or any other risks. Yeah. And the, the other thing is one of the goals of the criteria is not just to say, you know, don't use drug A, so instead you should use drug B. It's like we're basically saying be cautious about using drug A and think about other pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic alternatives that are going to get you to goal. So in the case of helping people with sleep, we know from studies that like the best thing to help people with sleep better than any drug is something like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Safer works better, right? Mm -hmm. And so like hard to get, don't want to downplay like the limitations on access to therapy and costs and coverage issues. I mean, they're real and they're there. But the, the point is just is is not you should just be subbing out beers drugs for other drugs. Is you should be you know considering reducing use of those drugs and thinking what else can I do to help the patient, which might often include non pharmacologic alternatives. How do you decide which drugs to include uh, on this list? Is there like a lot of debate? Is there what does that process look like? It's a real sausage uh, making process. I think that that and I think it's the most difficult part of the whole process is is our literature search um, yeah. 
because you really can't do a, an online search and say, okay, what drugs cause harm in older people? Right. And, you know, come up with the new literature. So we cast a very broad net um, in terms of search terms. And as a result, we get back tens of thousands of articles hmm. that have to be gone through either by title or abstract to throw out the, the things that are of no interest to us or that are redundant, the review articles, the case studies, um, opinion pieces, things like that. So we're trying to find articles that maybe support, and we do search the existing criteria so we can look for new drugs for those, to, to whether support what we've said or are going to change what we said. Um, and then we're also looking for new drugs. And that's where the panel comes into, into play because they will suggest topics of our new drugs that we need to look at. Um, they may provide uh, articles that they've seen uh, in the interim that we want to follow up on and see if there's any more data out there, other, other studies that would show the same thing. So, it, it's, so like it's a, a good thing. example of a new drug, I saw dexamethorphan quinidine. Oh, I, not really a new a drug, drug of the year, right? Those are it? decades old, but the combination in a very expensive pill becomes a new drug. Like, how right. did that one get on there? That one is on there in terms of drugs to avoid in people with heart failure, because there is a explicit warning in the label that we shouldn't use it for people with heart failure. Uh, uh, it is not on there um, uh, otherwise. And that's something that we discussed. It was sort of you know passed on for this criteria. It may sort of come on subsequently. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I can't say it may or may not. You know, a lot of other drugs may or may not. But what we do encourage people, like, so so we use our panel expertise to say, hey, are there any new drugs which are out there, or old drugs which are now kind of have increasing evidence of harm or lack of benefit that we should think about adding to the criteria? And so we just kind of, kind of crowdsource the panel and we encourage people to send in you know, for lack of a better word, nominations, like drugs we should look at, drugs you think you know, maybe should be on the criteria, maybe worth consideration. And we encourage that because we 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 love to sort of get get those ideas. So if you or any of your listeners have things that you want us to think about, please send it our way. We'd be happy to, can't guarantee what the outcome is going to be, but we'd be happy to sort of dig in a little bit. And the, the combination, the dextromethorphan quinidine um, combination has, has been in the criteria in the previous edition, is it, and it still is underused with caution. I'm sorry, and, and I, mis I, I, with, I misspoke. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. But that was the, I think, <laughs> <laughs> what what Eric was going for. Um, but but we we talk about not using it in behavioral symptoms um, with dementia, you know. But it's okay for the labeled uses. We're not going to challenge that. But these, these those off label uses where the risk of harms, particularly things like falls, were far greater than any benefit that were shown. Yeah, and it's um, one of the things in the in the use with caution table table four. So it's not a straight up like avoid. It's more just like be careful. Okay, I got another question. Should I use the AGS beers criteria or the stop guidelines or some other? Like, what's the benefit of this over some others? Stop in in particular. S T O P P. They're both good. They're slightly different. <laughs> they, they have converged over the years. So the stop criteria, uh, I mean, so basically the stop criteria are sort of beers like criteria yeah. that developed out of a group in Europe. They have their own process. They're thoughtfully constructed and there's a lot of overlap between the two. Like, you know, so if you look at the beers and you look at the stop and you think of a Venn diagram, look, the circles are largely overlapping. There are some yeah. different. So historically, the stop criteria have been in some ways less operationalizable for, you know, very useful for individual clinicians, but maybe less operationalizable for quality improvement because it includes, you know, stuff like, I can't remember if this is the exact phrasing, like you don't use a drug without an indication. Yeah. Uh, so it's not indicated or, you know, or be careful in, 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 you know, this certain situation that sort of got complex decision-making around it. And those things are true and absolutely useful uh, uh, and important to think about clinically. It becomes a little harder to operationalize that in terms of, you know, in terms of uh, a, a more explicit list. I'd say over time, the Beers criteria and the stop criteria have, if anything, come to come together a little bit. Over time, the Beers criteria has added more clinical nuance, in part mm -hmm. because we, we observe some of the misuse of the criteria. We're really trying to highlight, like, 
that clinical decision making is required and there are exceptions to these avoid statements. We just want to highlight that. And so it's sort of they're they're moving together. But they're complementary. We encourage people to look at the stop criteria as well. And you yeah. know, um, there's a lot of good stuff in there too. But like I said, a, a lot of the content is overlapping. Yeah. What, what Mike was trying to say is that the stop start criteria are more implicit and the beers criteria, AGS beers criteria are more explicit. Right. Thank well, you. that's interesting because because uh, stop is paired with start, you know, 20, I think it's 20 something meds to consider starting. Uh, is that ever something that you think about for the AGS beers criteria? I already have lots of gray hairs out there. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd be looking at a, an update every six years. <laughs> Yeah. And this is a huge amount of work. I hear you. And thank you for this tremendous amount of work for you and the AGS, which I understand was involved in um, helping with the literature search. Um, so that is that is certainly to be acknowledged. But I understand I understand where Eric's going with this. There are limitations to a guide that is primarily around medications to potentially avoid rather than what to do as the alternative. And um, it sounds like there was this, you know, alternatives list from 2015 and you're considering maybe, maybe there's an opportunity for somebody to take on um, beefing that up to make a, a start equivalent for drugs that are commonly used in the U.S. and not in Europe, for example. Exactly. And if someone has a, you know, a bunch of money burning your hole in the pocket and you would love to help, <laughs> to, 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 help to subsidize that sort of effort, you know. Yeah. I was one of the authors on that paper, and, and we tried to do an update in 2019, um, but for various reasons, it fell through. But, um, you know, one of the harder parts of the alternatives list is actually finding evidence to support your alternatives. I mean, we have a sometimes a desert in what we're looking for in, in the AGS beers criteria, but finding alternative recommendations and evidence to support them is, is also can be pretty barren. And you end up looking at the Scottish, you know, medical society for their guidelines on the treatment of insomnia. You know, for somebody else just who will support, you know, the steps for sleep hygiene or something like that. Coming close to my last question is, is there any evidence that the beers criteria changes any outcomes? I know it's a, these these are associated with you know, these medications are associated with bad things, but is there any evidence or is anybody looking at whether or not actually using the beers criteria changes any clinical outcomes? Or is that possible? I mean, there have been some studies looking at, I mean, so the observational studies looking at people taking beers criteria and those who don't and looking at their outcomes are really hard to interpret because there's so yeah. much potential confounding there. Uh, probably the closest thing to get it, the question you're asking is, say you do an educational intervention where you teach a bunch of people about the Beers criteria and see if you know their patients do better than people who didn't get the educational intervention, or a something integrated to electronic uh, medical record that sort of prompts people when a Beers criteria drug is being uh, flagged. Uh, you know, I say there's mixed evidence. It's hardly overwhelming that you know, that this is the best thing since sliced bread, you know, in terms of those outcomes. You know, some studies show no benefit at all. Some studies show some benefit. It's a little hard to, I think, come to a conclusive recommendation. Um, you know, that said, but that kind of intervention, like a lot of people don't end up stopping the meds. If you get an electronic alert, you know, how many times, you know, clinicians will just, you know, cancel out that alert and keep going. Mm -hmm. So the, so the real effect, if you could really do a randomized trial like that was sufficiently powered uh and methodologically rigorous that hasn't really been done to really see if you really are mm -hmm. stopping these meds i mean there's good data for deep prescribing uh more in the context of like polypharmacies or studies in nursing homes is where the best data is if you go through and you re really try to deprescribe with the focus on beers criteria meds but not only beers criteria meds there actually does appear to be a benefit for mortality and falls and in, in meta-analyses um, but you should take it with a grain of salt because th the studies have limitations. So there's a mm -hmm. suggestion of benefit, but it, it ain't rock solid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah we there, have, there are some studies that will show decreased readmission if they're stopped in, ho in, in mm -hmm. hospital. But there's also studies that show they don't because people end up being, being put back on the medications when they get back to their primary care or wherever they're, they're getting cared for out of the hospital, you know, within a certain period of time. So it's... It's it's like Mike said it's a it's a mixed bag and and um, the ideal study hasn't been done yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I have a, two more questions before Eric gets to his magic wand. Um, 
First is, we had a podcast recently about gabapentin, and I know Mike. we mentioned Mike's uh, prior study in Annals of Internal Medicine on off-label use of gabapentin. Where does gabapentin fall out on um, on the beer's criteria? So, so the inter- gabapentin so the- and opioids, I believe. Right, exactly. So exactly, mm-hmm. basically says, don't co-prescribe gabapentinoids, so gabapentin or pregabalin with opioids, unless you're sort of cross-titrating, because there's increased mm-hmm. risk of really bad things like respiratory suppression and death among people who get both. And then we also say that you should avoid the use, uh, you know, if possible, of of three or more CNS active medications. So basically Mm -hmm. try to avoid CNS active polypharmacy. And gabapentinoids are one of the long list of CNS active drugs, also includes antidepressants, benzodiazepines, you know, skeletal muscle reactions, yada, yada, yada. I guess my point, though, is, you know, medication landscape shifts rapidly, right? And in response, partially, we think, in response to the opioid epidemic and concern about prescribing opioids and maybe in search of uh, other medications to prescribe for people with dementia and behavioral disturbances, there's been a rise in prescribing of gabapentin. And I'm wondering if there's a way that the AGS beers criteria could be nimble to response, respond to potentially inappropriate, you know, shifts you know, dramatic shifts in some cases with gabapentin in prescribing. Or another good example is uh, like for individuals with dementia, we're seeing this shift from, you know, antipsychotics and opioid use. And we're we're seeing a lot more of anti-seizure meds Mm -hmm. uh, used in them. Yep. I have to have us take a look at it from a different perspective, I think, in terms of, again, looking at the efficacy side of it more um, than... The harms, because we've already got them in there for harms, at least uh, gabapentin and the and then the other antiepileptics, antiepileptics in the drug drug interaction section. So we we would have to take a look at the at the evidence and decide um, how it weighs with the efficacy weighs with harms mm-hmm. to determine whether they would go in beers as beers is currently structured or if they would go in a use with caution kind of kind of schedule. Yeah. Okay. I believe that's something we didn't really explicitly consider for this update, but that's exactly the kind of suggestion that we welcome Mm -hmm. uh, so that we can kind of put it on the list to think about for subsequent updates. Um, And and again, it does reinforce the point that, you know, one of the things that is in there about basically don't use antipsychotics for the management of behavioral symptoms of dementia unless other Mm -hmm. stuff has failed, but non-pharmacologic interventions have failed in the patient's threat to self or others. So that comports with a lot of other guidelines. What it doesn't mean is, okay, stop using antipsychotics and go ahead and go crazy with gabapentin and carbamazepine (laughs) or whatever. So like, EPA for everybody. We don't want that to be misunderstood. (laughs) But wait, before we get to the song, here's another. I have my final question is about this again about shifting and rapidly changing landscape. Uh, what about new drugs that come on the market? Aducanumab, Lucanumab. How do you consider those? Do they appear at the nth hour right as you're about to publish? And what do you do in those cases? Um, thoughts about that? Well, we had a, a early on, um, or maybe in the middle of our process here, we had a discussion about Aducanumab and what to do with it. But I think that problem sort of resolved itself <laughs> um, in terms of it's kind of going away. But with, with the with the, the second coming and the everybody third coming, thinks aducanumab's going away and it keeps on rising from the grave. We'll see about that. <laughs> we'll see. And, but well, anyway, that's food for thought for three or four years from now. All uh, right. My last question is: uh, Where can I find the beers criteria? Well, it'll be published in JAGS, and it'll be available um, on the AGS website, and there'll be um, materials both for clinicians as well as for patients, for the public, through the Health on Aging um, site as well, a, a couple of different documents um, on that, and then there'll be a, uh, a pocket card that people can download. Great. With the and we'll have links to those um, on our show notes. Oh. And, an, and an app, too, so... And an app. There's an, an app, app for that. Great. Well, Alex, you want to give us more of the... What, what's the title again? Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood by the Animals. Here we go. A little bit. Baby, don't you know I'm human? Have thoughts like any other man. 
Sometimes I find myself alone and regretting some foolish thing, some simple thing I've done. I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. Oh Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. Todd and Mike, thanks for joining us for the Chair Pop Podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yes. And to all of our listeners, thank you for your continued support. And we'd like to thank everybody who's donated more than $250 over the last year, including Matthew Schuster, Daryl Owens, Susan Nelson, Christopher Heck, Lindsay Yorman, Mo Rizawi, Sue Borson, Carrie Rubenstein, Marissa Galicia Castillo, Cara Bischoff, Kate Mesrich, James Tulski, Louise Aronson, Asher Edwards, Mark Apfel, Michael Bordofsky, Dwayne Dobschutz, Fish Brandt, Kelly Strait, Daryl Owens. Times two. Roseanne Leipzig, <laughs> Elizabeth Chung, Amis Samoji, Harry Hahn, Nick Schneeman, Ed Mateen, Jeff and Lena Galbraith, and Himanshu Mahotra. Thanks, everybody, for your support. Thank you.